few days ago you tweeted our political age is uh, marked with vulgarity and a cloying greed for attention slash power but desperate times and desperate political leaders are short lived the world doesn't abide ugliness for long could you please elaborate on that well you know this is a uh, an unfortunate fact of our age if we look at political discourse whether at home or abroad it's exceedingly ugly it's exceedingly intolerant and it's now become a virtue to be power hungry it's now become a virtue to be hateful and to be dismissive of people's concerns um and we see that played out in countries close to home far away from home at home but i'm ultimately an optimist and i i think that governments and established powers whatever they may be are operating on this on this um spectrum right now but i think as people we are essentially allergic to intolerance to hate um to division and working on new kings that was something i saw in all my travels is that whatever borders people are putting up and whatever way in which they're choosing to speak about the other on a national level on a people to people level we are not scared of each other we want to know more about each other we want to know more about foreigners we want to know more about strangers we want to know more about cultures that are different than ours and at heart i think that's why the world cannot abide by ugliness because the human experience is a beautiful one I was really amazed to be in Peru uh, you know very much so on the other side of the world that has nothing in common with the south asian experience whether that's pakistan or india or bangladesh and to have people talk to me about our films and our music in a language that didn't even connect us you know they were speaking in spanish um i found that really moving and i found it moving to see how culture can be a balm for people how it can be soothing and it can make them feel like their suffering has not gone unnoticed i also went to a syrian refugee settlement in in lebanon and and that was also very moving to see that whatever is destroyed um human curiosity remains intact um the need to share stories cannot be cannot be broken by whatever power even war that was very moving um it really was um it really was an experience to write new kings of the world because it's not often that you get to look at you know big powers and then the people that are impacted by those big powers and this was a book that allowed me to do both and i was always heartened by the people at the receiving end we are more connected to more people than we've ever been before the ease in which one can spread information the ease in which one can get information can travel can move can do business all of those are the successes of globalization but the failure of globalization has been to live up to its promise that it was going to be the tide that lifts all boats and what we see happening is that those many 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 hundreds of millions of people who really uprooted their lives on the promise of globalization that if they moved from rural homes into the city they would be met by an outpouring of access and wealth and power in that sense they failed and they failed miserably and it's given rise to to many consequences um some of that is anger some of that is a very profound disassociation between people and places i think we've done a lot of cheerleading for globalization and i really think it behooves us now to do some questioning i think it's interesting that 
Um, a country that has an incredible problem with violence, with police violence, for example, America, has so many shows about cops. I mean, that can't be an accident, you know. How is it that a country that's been at war for the last 20 years has so many shows about, uh, or movies about uh, soldiers or secret service agents? That's a concerted effort to, to manipulate your sympathies and to make sure that when you're watching a, a show or a TV program or whatever, that you see these people who are at the helm of great violence as heroes. I think we see the same thing whether we're talking about Pakistani films or Bollywood films, you know. It's, it's pretty obvious <laughs> that, that there's an attempt to sway people to or against something. But I do think that that's, that has a limited power that can only work so much. And ultimately, as audiences, I think we are sensitive without realizing what we're sensitive to. If the story is good, you can pull people in any direction. If the story is bad, then you can't. Then it smells. Then it gives off a kind of odor. At the most surface level, uh, culture reflects society. And we come to it quite innocently, but it's not made innocently. So agendas are being written into culture, um, you know, it's being used to persuade people, it's being used to manipulate people for or against ideas. It certainly also has the ability to be led by society as well as to lead. But I think if we're looking at how it's been used, um, then certainly it's been used to direct our loyalties and our fidelities. Of course, someone on TikTok um, can go viral and get many, many millions of views. More than, let's say, a movie or uh, a band. And again, this might sound kind of frivolous or it might just sound like, oh, that's entertainment. But you have to remember that TikTok is a Chinese company. And then it doesn't sound so frivolous. Um, then, it's, then it's a lot more nuanced and more interesting. What are they learning about us? by watching us, by watching what captures our attention and what doesn't, you know. How are they dealing with um, multiple voices from different places? It's going to be an interesting five years ahead, I think, to see who wins the cultural race for our hearts and minds. I think there is a level of toxicity that's new. Um, I think whatever toxic elements existed before, we seem to have some kind of civility where you could have an opinion and I might not agree with you and have a differing opinion, but there was a lot of space between us and it didn't require me to paint you as a traitor or it didn't require me to paint you as an anti-national. Um, and it allowed our, our differing opinions to, to coexist, if not to meet some kind of agreement. I think social media has eroded that space. Um, you know, social media has also made everybody an expert. So everybody's an expert on everything. It doesn't matter, you know, if a war broke out tomorrow in, you know, I don't know, Sweden. Suddenly everyone would be an expert on Sweden, never having thought about Sweden before. And I guess it gets that from the fact that it's a fast medium. It doesn't really require you to think about or learn about anything you're saying. In my opinion, Pakistan is a young country. It's got a huge population of young people. And I think that makes it quite a powerful generation. And I think this generation has to ask itself a very serious question. Has to ask what vision of their country they would like to see. And if you don't see that vision, what is it that we can do together to ensure that the Pakistan, not just of today, but of tomorrow, is one that is big enough and brave enough to include everybody. And I think those are difficult questions to ask. Um, and they don't have easy answers. And they require us to be introspective as well. But I think on the one hand, it's an important time to do that. And we do that by communicating. We do that by listening um, and I think we do that by learning from each other and we, we have to 
We have to practice the values we wish to see. It has to start with ourselves. We have to, we have to be exactly what we wish our country to be. And we have to work um, in every part of our life in order to make Pakistan the country it deserves to be. My, my father always used to say that in, in life you have to move with clean hands, but also a warm heart and a cool mind. So those three together I think are an important combination.